is the open stage, which is just downstairs, and there we've got entrepreneurs, um, startups, uh, describing their companies and their ideas, and you're able to sit with them. It's, it's actually a very small, cozy um, stage, and you can ask them questions, have a direct conversation with them. Or around the corner, you can go to our power stage. We're offering about 20 workshops this week, um, and we want to punch that all week. Um, you can go in. You don't have to register or anything. You can go in and take part in the workshops. That's going to be on offer the entire week. Also, for our viewers on live stream, um, we know you're out there. We've been getting lots of messages on Facebook and Twitter for you, um, from you. Just want to remind you, you can follow us on Facebook at CBIT um, Global Conferences, and our hashtag is CGC13. That's where you can send questions. Um, you can send questions for our keynote speakers. Um, if we have time, we ask those. Um, if not, um, you know, we apologize for that. It depends on our time schedule. We're about to have a panelist discussion, and so we ask you to send your questions in for that as well. That's going to start in just a few minutes. So let's move on then. The energy sector, which we just heard about, is just one area that could benefit from a more intelligent infrastructure. Healthcare, transportation, education, public administrations are also prime candidates for smart solutions when we talk about infrastructures. Well, we'd like to spend the next 45 minutes discussing what solutions are available today and how realistic our plans for an intelligent infrastructure future are. So, with that, I'd like to call our four guests onto the stage now, and I hear that they are ready to come out. So, gentlemen, if you would come out, please. All right, hello, gentlemen. Take a seat here at our new Global Conferences bar. Any order? Yeah, wherever you want. There's no seating arrangement. Mm -hmm. As you see right there, I know someone asked if we were going to have name tags. We decided this year, in the interest of the environment, not to <laughs> print name tags. They're all up there uh, so you can see them. Um, all of you bring and interesting perspective when we're talking about infrastructures. You're all either um, from the energy sector, um, IT services sector, um, from the government, from public administration, or from the transportation sector. Um, so let me just begin by going through um, the round here and asking you um, each, how intelligent would you say our infrastructures are at the moment. Um, we hear about that all the time, so give us a snapshot of where we are right now. From the transportation sector, I would say if I would compare to school notes from one to six, six just to know is the worst one, right. I give it a clear five. Oh, <laughs> okay. All right, well, that's, not, that's a great way to start the discussion. Okay, so we're barely passing. We are barely passing because um, there is an asset the roads we have in Germany, mm -hmm. quite tremendous extended network, but it's just starting that IT is being used to make more of the scare resource in the long term. Mm -hmm. We are just starting to do these approaches. You jump into traffic jams without knowing, normally you sit in the car, get the information when you're in the jam. <laughs> so a lot of things can be done with more IT intelligence in a vehicle, as well as in the communication between vehicles. Okay. But so you're saying the, the, the IT, the technology is there, yes. but there's something else that's keeping it from being implemented to improve transport. Yeah. All right. And I, if I can read between the lines there, it probably has nothing to do with transportation. It may have to do with governments. It does not only, it, on the one side, it's put political decisions. That's mm -hmm. for sure one aspect, but it's also a behavioral change necessary with the consumer. Okay. So also the consumer has to accept what is the value? What do I get for it? Do I get, for example, we are doing tolling. Is really in the end tolling on the long term, even for normal cars, a topic to say no way? Mm -hmm. Or do you not at the at a certain point come? What would be a value, a counter value for the end consumer to say, hey, it's worthwhile that I'm getting the service. I'm willing to pay for that okay. because I get perhaps real-time information about traffic. Okay. That's, that's a great topic. We could even do an entire panelist discussion about that, about getting people on board when it comes to paying to use the highways. Um, Mr. Holtz, what do you say? Um, 
You're from the IT services industry. How smart are we? Now, let me pick an example from the healthcare sector. So in Germany, as you know, we are going to implement the health card, so which is quite, quite an ambitious undertaking. And I think the, the network which is established as of today is just a very fundamental base. Mm -hmm. And I think that it was purposely done or consciously done because um, all the added value which the network could provide is not there yet. And um, I think here are many reasons why it is not there. Definitely not a technology reason. It's more that uh, you can imagine an area like healthcare with ethics, with security. Uh, the society uh, needs to have a consensus how to uh, elaborate how smart networks should be, could be. And I think this is a constraining factor in this specific network area. Okay. What about you, Mr. Archer? You've come to us from the other side of the planet. Um, how smart is the infrastructure in Australia? Uh, well, I guess it's getting better very quickly right now. Mm -hmm. I guess to, to set the context, um, uh, 10 years ago, our social welfare agency, Centrelink, embarked on turning on online services for the first time, and there were four transactions, literally just four transactions made available in 2002. Today, there are hundreds of those. Um, uh, and, and the growth has been phenomenal. There are now 50% of transactions done with customers uh, through online. So it's quite a radical growth. But if you look back 10 years ago, most of those transactions had to be handcrafted around very, very um, limited bandwidth and, and not very intelligent networks. Uh, today, um, the government's investing in a national rollout of, of broadband uh, with fibre to the premises. And uh, we're already seeing some of the benefits uh, to, be, uh, to citizens and to businesses as a result of that. So in some ways, we're seeing the intelligence um, shift from, from the back end where the uh, creators of IT systems have had to work, do workarounds to address those limitations to where the, I think the intelligence is now starting to appear as we roll out the National Broadband Network. Okay, we're going to talk about that, the rollout of that in, in just a second. And Mr. Wolf, what do you think? Yeah, there are actually two, net, two network infrastructure I would like to, to speak about. The one is the energy network, the other one the railroad network. Uh, the energy network is, is a bit a two-sided metal. Uh, there's a lot of automation on the very high voltage layers. It's well uh, supervised, it's well controlled, well measured. But everything below that, everything under that, there's no intelligence, there's no smartness in the network. There's no ability to measure uh, electronic, uh, electrical consumption in a household, for example. There's no smart meter roller there. And this is the prerequisite for any smart application of using energy when it's available. We have now in Germany 25% of uh, the total production volume last year was from renewable energies, which is by definition extremely volatile. So smartness is needed to use that when it's there. Mm -hmm. But storing electric energy is still very cumbersome, expensive or inefficient. Um, a little bit different it, it, it is on the, on the railroad side. Uh, railroads have always been smart in the way that they've been protected other than roads. Uh, however, the way this is being done is, is something of age now. So we need to go a step further to increase the density of traffic on existing railroads, which is not yet, by far not yet on a level where it should be. So we could use uh, much more traffic on existing rail without extending them by putting more smartness in the operation of those. Mm -hmm. And that is certainly a big area. Would, let me ask all of you um, as well, when we're talking about um, increasing the smartness of, of infrastructures in, in all sectors, um, do you find yourself having the conversation over and over again, um, or maybe a debate about infrastructures being, still being a public good? There is always the, the discussion about privatizing mm -hmm. infrastructures. We, we have that here in Germany. Um, or the government picking up the tab for improving infrastructures. Um, let's ask our man from Australia. Um, obviously, Australia has made a very bold decision with, with this rollout. Maybe if you could, um, just for our audience, tell us a little bit about the rollout and, and, and about the cost, the expenditures, also that the government's taking on. So around four years, just, just under four years ago, the government announced that they would invest um, 
just under 30 billion euro um, in rolling out a fibre to the premises uh, uh, network for the entire country. Um, or such a 93% of, of, of actual uh, citizens will get access to the fibre solution. The other 7% will get high-speed wireless via satellite or, or fixed uh, wireless solutions. Um, that decision was made um, for a number of reasons, uh, not least being that there was um, a very much a dominant uh, commercial player within the Australian market at the time and another smaller uh, provider of, of network services. Uh, it was an opportunity to kind of reset the, um, the, the, um, the country in terms of its future for uh, broadband access. Uh, I guess it recognised uh, that access to broadband was profoundly critical to the future of the country, to its economy and its citizens. And so the investment in the National Broadband Network was, was structured such that it was a wholesale service and that um, all retail providers um, of telecommunications services, of internet, voice services, would essentially acquire access to that wholesale service. Uh, the government has announced that at the end of a, uh, a, 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 a some, some years after the rollout has been completed, it will look to, to sell that asset. So it will eventually move back into private, private ownership. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it is the, the impetus, though, is, is coming from the public sphere. I, I think it's a, it's a reflection of the fact that there was an enormous demand for access to internet across the country. A uh, reflection on the very, you know, the, the fact that Australia is very large. There was a, a different grade of service that was available to citizens in the rural and remote areas, and a, and a desire to to level the playing field in terms of access to broadband services. The, the, where, where did the desire to level that playing field come from? Um, if I, I was just in the United States a couple of weeks ago, and people are always talking about patches in, in, in the networks wherever they go, whether it be for cell phone service or even if it's the internet. Um, th there, there is no consistency and constant coverage anywhere in, in any of, of these consumer infrastructures. But no one's talking about the government coming in and um, you know, taking on big expenditures to make it a reality for everyone. What happened in Australia to, to actually make that the case, that, pe that the government was willing to pick up the tab? I think it's a case that Australia, historically, the governments have always looked to invest, make major investments in, invest, in, in, in infrastructure to support the interests of, of citizens. And there's, a, I guess there's an issue about equity of access as well. Equity of access. You, guys, you gentlemen here are nodding. You, you agree? <clears throat> now, maybe when I pick it up, I think it depends on the kind of infrastructure we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Again, coming to the example of healthcare, I think here, here the state, here the um, social society has uh, the duty to set a frame in order to assure the right usage, um, avoid misusage, yeah, because healthcare is not a real market, should never become. So that kind of uh, discussions, but I, I could imagine for telecommunication it is uh, fully different. Yeah? Um, what I think actually we are doing here in Germany, as I understood, uh, that is the investment of the private uh, companies, or not. Um, so I think that is uh, how, how the balance uh, between state or government investments and frames or private frames, it's very specific and depending. Mm -hmm. Toll Collect, what's the, the attitude there? I mean, obviously, you, you work directly with the German government. We see we have interesting discussions. Historically, there was a decision taken that tax money will be invested to do these, fund, these needs. But I would say over the long term, when I look at the funding situation of each of these national states, when I look at, especially in Germany, the aging of the infrastructure, to give you a feeling, more than 50% of the German highway system is older than 35 years. Where shall the funds come from? And it's, I think the challenge is the, to generate acceptability in the public, to say something was until now for free. It wasn't, you paid various means, but I have to pay suddenly from a day X an amount to make use of something, which is normal when we go to France, which is normal when we go to Italy. But this is a, I think this is an approach 
uh, we have to tackle and we will be forced to tackle it due to the funding needs. Mm -hmm. And in addition, uh, yes, it always depends which year you have. When you have an election year, I think someone will be on the tiptoes in avoiding these topics, but make these decisions, these calls at the later stage. I mean, I, I don't want to talk about too much about, about politics here, but, but every time we talk about changing infrastructures, making them smarter, you know, the notion of politics always comes into play. In Australia, you see that the notion, at least for the, the internet, it is a public good. Um, there are countries where transportation is considered, the infrastructure is considered a public good. Um, Mr. Wolf, what's, what's your take on, on the philosophy debate about this? Germany is trying to, to run a course which is as much private as possible, I would say. Mm -hmm. Definitely in the telecom field where, where no, there will be no national rollout plan for fiber in Germany. It will be run by private means with maybe a little help or support in areas where it's simply economically not, not feasible. Exactly the 93% is also not by coincidence, it's simply because it will never pay off. Huh? Nobody can afford that. The same is being tried right now with energy networks, with the enormous rise of renewable energies in, in Germany, specifically coming from the north because there's a lot of wind, uh, the usage is more in the south, so that there will have to be highways for energy transport to the south. And uh, so far it is all planned to be done privately. So there are guaranteed uh, payback uh, for, for everybody who is, is running those, so, so network fees, which will enable that. Let's see whether it's going to work. So far, I'm very positive. I think it definitely can work. The problem I see right now is, is more on the side of getting the acceptance with the population that new infrastructure has to be built, which is okay. not always beautiful, to be yeah. very clear. But not so much on the, on the means of, of, of uh, whether this model could run or not. Okay. A little bit different it is for the production itself. I mean, putting uh, large wind farms into the North Sea Whoever has been there knows this is a very <coughs> rough territory, is a risky thing and will remain a risky thing. But it's all private money. There's no public money spent there. Okay. Um, just wanted to <coughs> say if there's anyone in the audience who has a question, uh, feel free to ask. Just raise your hand. We've got people with microphones. Um, our lights are really bright. It's hard to see all of you. Um, in the back, if there's anybody, just let us know. Also on Twitter, um, if there are any questions, you can um, send it to us. Um, it's the hashtag CGC. 13. Mr. Wolf, let me pick up on this question about energy, the delivery of energy here in Germany. With the current infrastructure, the way it is, do you see a bottleneck being created, um, especially now when people are talking about the Energiewende, the change in energy policy, Germany's exit from nuclear power? A bottleneck um, in terms of production is not going to be there for the next four years but because there are a couple of, of still upcoming projects which will have to be finished and will be connected to the network, then the balance, the total balance will be negative because there will be more outgoing plants than incoming, at least from a planning perspective right now. On the other side, uh, the, uh, the rise of renewable energy is so fast, PV photovoltaic, for example, is much faster than planned or actually even wished for, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> also, wind is doing well, that overall, that is not so much the risk. The risk is something different. The risk is that energy is being produced in areas where people don't use it or where they cannot use it because there are not enough people living. So what is needed is a grid, a network, which mm. is transporting the energy to those places where it is needed. Wind in the south of Germany will never be as profitable in terms of production hours than in the north. But so that's because of the grid, the way the grid is right now. The grid is simply lacking. So the decision to build the grid and to put this in the hands of the Bundesnetzagentur, which is the same uh, agency who is looking after uh, um, all kinds of network infrastructures, has been a very smart and correct one. But those networks have to be built. Otherwise, there will be issues, for sure. There really is no country in the world right now that has an energy policy like Germany's. I'm Correct. obviously exiting from nuclear power. Germany is the first in the world uh, to do that. Um, there are no models for Germany to learn from or to pick up on. That puts Germany in uh, a unique position. Um, you're actually creating the models that maybe other countries are going to follow. There, there's no best practice of uh, you yes. know, lists out there for you to follow. So 
uh, you know, our three Germans on the panel, let me ask you, you gentlemen about this. Um, is Germany and the, the future of its infrastructure, energy infrastructure, are, is Germany in a good place right now or a bad place? You want me to answer first? <laughs> uh, and it's seeing, honestly speaking, seeing from, a, from, from the side uh, of a supplier for infrastructure, yeah. we're definitely on the good side. Because <laughs> lots of investments are, will happen. And most of them, as I said, uh, done, done from the private side. So that's good. Obviously, existing business models, they're all under biggest pressure, even if not to say a big question mark. When you look at the balance sheets of the big energy producers in Germany, they are all in, in, in deep trouble, in, in, in deep problems, clear. This will not end tomorrow. It will take a while until the system is adapting to that. But there's so much opportunity in the system which has to be taken up. So I see this really rather more an opportunity than a risk, clearly. However, there is the general question of acceptance of energy price per se. That's probably the biggest popular risk. How long are people willing to pay mm. more per year, per kilowatt hour, uh, for the electrical consumption than the year before? Is there a theoretical border? Probably not. But how far will this acceptance go? And if politically uh, there is an uproar against uh, a too high rise of, of uh, cross-funding of renewable energies, this might bring uh, enormous pressure to the system. Okay, yeah. <coughs> I, I, I think uh, what Germany is um, undertaking here as a journey, I think is a big opportunity yeah. for us to, to uh, develop a business, a market, business models. What I'm questioning is um, how, we, how we deal with, with our balance between federalism and central government. Yeah, just to explain you, because also an energy example, uh, smart meters. Um, yes. I think <laughs> since 10 years we know what uh, we are able to do with smart meters. And in France, for example, we, we are managing for the rollout for 50, for 50 million households. You know, because they decided to, to leverage it, to do it, uh, they have the state near owned uh, energy uh, supplier and so they do it they just do it so they make the technology available and in germany i think we have uh, maybe 100 pilots running um, we have thousand municipalities um, dealing finding business models yeah is it the stadtwerk or is it the city yes. or what do you do i i think that is a question for me how we is do we have time enough uh, to answer and to find answers for these fundamental questions and can have the luxury to have this federalism discussion, what we are doing uh, actually right now. So that will be a challenge from my point you, of view. You think we need more centralization? I think for these uh, topics we need more centralization. I think federalism, and uh, we even need to look on the European level or global level, I think federalism for infrastructure, um, I think this time is gone. As it's being, sorry if I'm interrupting, as it's being decided upon on the national grid, on its, or at least let's say on the national HVDC lines, where the there's, well, planning authority will be a national agency, not a state agency, not mm -hmm. 17 state agencies. But he's perfectly right. On, on, on the other elements we're talking about, smart metering and stuff, there's nothing like this. Okay. Mr. I fully share the view about <coughs> this is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. First mover advantage, quite clearly. But we have to keep in mind, as was it stated earlier, the social implications of the increasing prices. And the wish I have, if I would have one, is uh, that we that the politics stand where they are, saying these are the criteria we have set, these are the prices, and there are not implications from the outside which cripples the decision. You mentioned the you mentioned the pricing issue. Yes. It could easily become a social topic. And therefore, we have clearly, and I think it's fully appreciated to have this decision, and now we have to make the right steps to move ahead. Mm -hmm. And not suddenly to go back for whatever political reasons to say this one, this one, this one, for the sake of an election. I but, mitigate. But that, that's what always comes up, right? When we're talking about smarter infrastructures, uh, it's always a political um, 
discussion as well. Mr Archie. You... I, I, I think there's an interesting parallel in, uh, in relation to the approach we've taken with the NBN. You know, there's, it's, it's, it's quite logical that if you have limited capital resources, whether they are in the state's hands or they're in commercial hands, that you want to make the best use of those capital resources. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense for you know, a substantial number of commercial players to be chasing um, the same opportunities and yet with parallel or duplication or triplication of infrastructure because that's you know, where the population is and then have substantial um, uh, you know, portions of the population underserved or not served at all. So I think that there is a, there is a time and a place for, for this sort of approach. Okay, we've got, um, I've been told we've got a couple of questions on Twitter. Um, let's pull up one here um, from Frank. He's asking, would you say that we need more regulatory efforts to push the Energiewende, the, the change in energy policy in Germany? More regulation. What do you gentlemen say to that? I, I think there's already a lot of regulation for my taste it's already a little bit too much there's actually right now a little bit too less market inside um, so I would not I would not I would not ask for more regulation uh, there's I think there's ample room for letting creativity flow we should not hamper that by putting too much of regulation there my view and you don't see regulation um, standing in the way of, of of this new of this model that Germany is creating right now in terms of providing a smart energy infrastructure? Um, I wouldn't go as far that it's, it's standing in the way, but it's uh, the, 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 the framework which has been set or the definition which has been done, talking about smart meters, for example, we have discussed, uh, Mr. Holt, for three years for the so-called security profiles on smart meters. Now we have done them. Now let's go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's implement them. Huh? So we don't need to discuss this any longer. I think we have certainly the, the, the toughest, the strictest, and the most advanced security profiles of any smart meter definition in the world. So, but now let's go ahead. So okay. no more regulation on that. What, what do you say, Mr. Holtz? Are you in the no more regulation camp? <clears throat> no, I cannot really say this. I, I do believe, again, that there's a need for regulation. Uh, Again, society is, um, needs to be protected and um, uh, we, we have to achieve something here. So I think it's really the, the balance. And the, the point I made uh, before was um, in this uh, situation, uh, is federalism uh, still uh, the right way for us? I, that I would question, uh, but I would in principle say that regulation is, is a need and um, it could be even a strength in mm -hmm. order to, to give the right frame for the framework, for the infrastructure, in order to develop uh, in the right direction. Um, so I would rather say I'm, I'm in favor of regulations, but uh, it's always a question of balance. And you, you work for Otto, so you're responsible uh, for Germany, but your company obviously is um, you know, involved all over the globe. Is there um, a country, is there an economy that you could point us to to say they've got the right balance when it comes to putting as many intelligent features into their <coughs> infrastructures as possible? Who's got it right right now? It also depends uh, where you are looking. When we just stay with, uh, with the energy, mm -hmm. I cannot judge it. Uh, I say I just took the example of smart meters yeah. and, and say, okay, here I think obviously Germany is, is far behind. And I think smart meters could be a precondition to have a smart mm -hmm. grid which enables us to, to manage this energy change. Um, so there I think we, we could become faster and smarter, uh, learn from more centralized uh, governments. Um, otherwise I, I would not uh, think well, I have no example yet. If, um, let me ask you, you had mentioned healthcare earlier. Is, is there a country where you say they've, they've got the right combination now? Their, their, their healthcare infrastructure uh, is where it should be for becoming more intelligent? I think here are some of examples. I think in healthcare, specifically uh, Germany is, is, I would say, yeah, catching up. I think. Uh, when you see in the northern European countries um, when, how they developed, or even Austria, which uh, 
I think it has a much advanced uh, infrastructure here. Uh, I think Germany is catching up. It is now um, was a smart move with um, getting all the discussions with uh, data protection and so on out of this healthcare net, healthcare card. I think now they have the uh, Trojanian horse, so to say. The Trojan yeah. horse, yeah. <laughs> which, uh, which now I think uh, gives now enough uh, space uh, to let the different uh, stakeholders uh, see and the different application and value services develop. Mm -hmm. I think we will catch up soon. That's my opinion. Okay, Mr. Kitchen. Let me add one thing to the thing of do we need more regulations? Yes. Uh, I think we also we might say pro con for that. We should also look on the word called harmonization. Of course, from the perspective in Germany, we could always say let's regulate, let's regulate. We have to see what is doing France, what is doing the Netherlands, because we have to harmonize at least on a European scale, because power is going across Europe. Transport is going across Europe. Uh, you're the lucky one. <laughs> Australia. <laughs> right. Right. But yes. overall, you have to say, we also have to keep an eye on the harmonization approach. Mm -hmm. Second point you mentioned, do we have some examples? And I gave you an example. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I put on purpose Germany, because the Germans have the tendency to put their glass normally half empty. Yes. The Germans could have had to make the decision at one time to sell their high world network. And they said, we don't sell it. We put a billing system on top of it. Their highway network. Their highway network. Okay. And we put a billing system on top of it and keep it. And that's why I'm... That's why you're here. Why I'm here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and with that, they generated 30 billion and yeah. came out of this, I would call it, nasty discussion in public. You sell our core asset, the roads. We, as a consumer, have paid for via taxes anyway. Right. So, so the consumers are being asked to pay twice. <laughs> in their mind, it would have meant. And there we come back to the point of acceptability. A asking the consumers to accept having to pay twice. When it comes to for, transportation. For, for them. For I, them. Mean, I mean, it is, it is an interesting discussion, isn't it, when we talk about uh, intelligent transport infrastructures. You're talking about augmenting what's already there. Well, what's already there in, in most places has been paid for with public money. Yes. Um, and not in all countries. Not in all countries. France, Italy, these countries have done the private investment private, scheme right. at that time. Why? Because at that stage, in the 60s, they didn't have the money. They didn't have the euro crisis exactly. either. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, so in, in a lot of countries now, you're asking people to take an infrastructure that is there, and you're asking them, okay, we have to improve it or else we're going to have serious problems. And you're asking them to help finance that. Um, then who does the best job of creating this acceptability? this acceptance in society. Who do you gentlemen think does that? Is it someone like Mr. Archer, um, who's from the government, who can s stand on his soapbox and, and preach that <laughs> from the government? Or does it have to come from the private sector? I would say we would make, make ourselves life too easy, saying, welcome to the government. I think it's also the task of, the, of us. And that's the reason why we're sitting here, to discuss that. To say, we have to create awareness to say, things have to change. I mean, th things have changed. I mean, your title, Mr. Archer, I think is very interesting. But, and when I was uh, doing research on you, um, if you put Glenn Archer in Google or whatever search engine you use, um, you use the first three letters come up are CIO, um, and, which is Chief Information Officer, correct? Yes. Now, that is not a title that you find usually in a government. You just don't. Um, and I think that in itself maybe says something about the attitude that the Australian government takes um, when it's looking at uh, its infrastructure, the smartness of its in infrastructure, and, and, and treating it and communicating its ideas to the public. Uh, would you agree with that? I mean, are you running information and, and your infrastructure, is it being run like a company would run it? So the title of Chief Information Officer has been, one been around for quite some time yeah. and it's usually um, now applied to the individual who is in charge of IT within a large organisation. In the context of what I do, I'm responsible for whole of government policy and strategy and I've provided advice to the government on major investments. 
So we, we essentially assess proposals coming forward from departments and agencies around how, uh, and advise the government on how best um, to allocate its resources. Um, so that, uh, I guess getting back to the title, yes, I, I, I think um, in my previous CIO roles, um, they've been very much around how to, uh, have also included uh, how we need to manage the information assets and resources of, of those departments, both to make you know, good use of them, uh, to protect the interests of government in the context of those assets, to protect the interests of citizens often in terms of privacy issues. So the CIO is often uh, integrally involved in all of those, all those components. Um, to look at you know, how you use those, uh, those data assets um, um, more effectively to deliver good government policy. And if that's around how you target your social well pro programs, your health programs, your education programs, often it's the CIO who's called on to provide some guidance or uh, information about what was, how, how successful was the previous program, did it actually achieve its desired outcome, and where should we be going next? You know, where, where are there groups of citizens who are being poorly served in relation to health or education? So, so, so that, 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 that word information is, is, quite, is quite, I think, insightful. Yeah, I, I would agree. We've got another question on um, Twitter here, I've been told, why is the Industry not forcing smart solutions more. I get the impression that they only see it as something that's nice to have. There were with you again, Mr. Kishman. I mean, it's just nice to have, right? I think for us, it's always the case where's the business case behind it. Mm -hmm. First part, do we have a business case? Then do we have the right frame, the political set frame saying, okay, this is the playground I can play on. And is there a willingness to do things? We have heard about uh, the, um, the, um, the healthcare topic. We have heard about the power and uh, I think there are a lot of business opportunities we can go for. Smart metering, being on the car, pay as a drive or in a truck as we have it nowadays, even with pollution recognition saying who a stinker pays more than us, others. Mm -hmm. This is there. Uh, but I think to, in the end, say, okay, let's go for it, requires money. And you have to make the right calls in that moment to say, if you put the money in that pocket, you have to decide not to put it in this pocket. And the impression you could have right now is everybody keeps his money a little bit together. There we are back to the funding exercise. Yeah. I mean, we are in the age of austerity here in Europe, right? Well, maybe you're not in Australia, but... Not so much in Germany, I would say. No. Either, yeah. Not really. No. Not really. No. Not, 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 in, not in Germany. Not, right. Um, but answering that, 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 that question, I think, when I look at two examples, there is a very, very nice startup scene in that smart solutions environment, however far you, you, you put the framework. When you just look at how many ideas are coming up and on this fair seabed, you will see a lot of that. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't see that the industry is not pushing solutions out now. There's, yes, we are in, a, in an early market and not everybody will be successful or not every standard is there yet, for sure not. Uh, so standardization will be an issue, of course. That's the framework which uh, Carsten was just talking about. This is simply needed. But whenever startups, uh, the startup money is going into new areas, they go for things where, there's, where it's bristling, where, where chances are there, yeah. clearly. Mm -hmm. Also on the industry side, when I look at our own company or in our, at our uh, competition, there's a lot of investments happening in that area. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so negative on, on that end. It is yet the case that we do not yet have a very large market, yes, but the market I'm sure will be created and will be helped by, even by industries which we haven't even touched upon so far, like the consumer electronics. Eh? They will drive for it, they, will, they want it. They, for them, for the TV industry, I think it's a, it's a probably a death question or you can put it <laughs> a, a life question, however you want to put it, they need something in addition to what they do right now. I, I clearly see a large push coming so the, from that. So the, the demand for something yeah. new, for something smarter 
is always there when you're talking about consumer electronics. But that is interesting. The, the demand for consumer electronics, consumer gadgets, is always there. We take it as a given that the, the demand is always there. But we're not talking about in that same term when we're talking about infrastructures, are we? But it, no, yeah? I, I think the difference is now that with, with the consumer really dictating to the industry, exactly. it's, it's driving um, you know, governments and, and larger pr uh, purchases of technology uh, in a direction that we perhaps in the past uh, uh, you know, aren't, aren't as comfortable with. You know, the whole consumerisation um, theme is in fact, I think, um, gathering speed. So governments are no longer in a position to kind of dictate to IT vendors about how they will build, you know, the latest gadget. Um, we, we will um, make use of, of consumer products. Um, we will, and, and often that's quite valuable for us, uh, we have to uh, cope with our staff and, and our citizens and, and businesses choosing to use consumer products. Um, so that's, that, that has changed the dynamic quite a lot in terms of government and how we build and, and support new IT. And also um, when it comes to the government financing, um, R&D for example, um, a lot of the drive that's coming, as you're saying, is coming from, from outside the public sphere. Um, so the government is becoming more than ever also a consumer, mm. wouldn't, you, wouldn't you say? I mean, is that, is that the feeling also here in Europe? For sure. For sure, especially due to these funding constraints. And let me bring one more example. Let's take a time travel, go back to 1990. Just imagine at that time about such a device. This was done by the private sector. For example, the whole development, when we see nowadays, we have a mobile telephone. 1990, we could choose between a red telephone, a yellow telephone, I don't know, three kinds of colors, and that was it, fixed right. line. Yeah. And how the thing developed from uh, SIMs you can send, SMSs you can send, nowadays you have your old emails with you, how things did develop, where I'm going at is, so we, don't have have, we don't have these big banks, these seeable big banks, but as you earlier said, a lot of startups are there, they are yeah. working, and yes, we are not up to 40 million customers at these ones, but they will have to develop, they have to mature. Did you have a mobile phone in 1990? No, I didn't. I was about to say, you would have been one of <laughs> I don't, yeah. No, that was, I would have been a grass species at yeah, that time. Yeah, you would have, you would have. <laughs> and you would have had a strong arm. <laughs> yeah, he would. Um, he would. Let's, um, Mr. Holtz, let me ask you about this too, about then the public sphere being the consumer, the governments being the consumers here, that, that, that change. Would you agree that that's, that's what we're seeing? And, and where would you see it, uh, where would you say it's strongest? Uh, honestly, I'm not really, um, as this term, public or government becomes mm -hmm. a consumer, I'm not really um, tangible uh, to me. Um, I, it was, you know, the government, instead of the government investing in R&D, the government driving the creation of something, instead of that happening now, you have from the outside private companies, the commercial sector offering services and technologies. And, almost dictating to governments, this is what is, is so smart, you have no choice but to take it. Then I think that should, should be the way, because that is not the role of governments to, to have R&D and develop uh, uh, smart infrastructures. I think that needs to come from the um, yeah, economy, the society, the ideas. And again, government then has a, an important role to have the right balance between um, liberalism, uh, regulatory and so on. And actually, I, I think our infrastructure is already quite smart. Um, it again depends, yeah, but when I see now um, in telecommunication and consumer electronics, yeah, so there's another attempt from this company with the fruit in the brand, you know, where it goes to television and so on. I, I think it's, it's amazing what's going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't have the feeling that we are uh, in Stone Age. Stone Age, no, uh, Stone Age no. point of view, yeah. Uh, yeah, Mr. I, I think the, you know, the, uh, another example aside from mobile phones is just the changes we've seen in terms of software uh, providers. So, you know, since you asked about 1990, in, th in those times it was very common for government departments and agencies to build their own HR and finance systems and they, they carefully crafted those around their unique business needs. Um, but today with, you know, with, you know um, 
you know, co common off-the-shelf software, as it's called, or COTS, um, uh, or commercial off-the-shelf software. Um, you know, the, the, um, the model is much more around acquiring capability from commercial vendors and then just configuring it to your needs. So, you know, there's one very large um, German company that uh, that uh, specialises in that, mm -hmm. um, and so and I think that government benefits from that. I mean, we benefit from the investment in research and development of commercial providers of these systems, and um, arguably it it, um, it works well from from our perspective in being able to leverage a, gr um, a far greater. Um, uh, set of resources around that sort of ecosystem, whether that's software developers or hardware providers or database providers. So I think, you know, uh, it, 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 there is a great deal of logic in moving away from, uh, moving away from that sort of government-built environment to this, um, this consumer-led um, uh, approach. What do you say, Mr. Wolf? Um. <clears throat> I was I was just thinking about um, how this 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 pro progression is, is 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 being seen. I mean, uh, the uh, the rollout of of, of, of of infrastructure driven driven by governments and and, and, and their and their public use is is clearly uh, on the rise. So I I, uh, I don't see that that there will be a a drawback. In the, in, the, in, the, in the near term. So the, the, the push is so big that nobody will step back from for that. Public, for the public yeah, the, administrations the, to, to yeah. spend money. They, 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 they simply cannot. The, the question is how they're going to do it. So mm -hmm. with, with different models, and we, we saw different models discussing around this table, there are different models in the world, and there are probably different challenges, different speeds, but the, the, the general question, I think this is undisputed, for, at least from, from, my, from my point of view. Okay. Um, we are <clears throat> almost out of time, so let me ask each of you, to, since we're talking about smart, smarter infrastructures, uh, look into the future for us, and let's do something that's very tangible, maybe look two or three years down the road. Um, what infrastructure or, or set of infrastructures do you think we're going to see the most improvement in, in terms of becoming smarter? Where is the best example? Mr. Kirchner, I'll let you start. And I'm, if you want to say the highways, you can. <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I, this, is, this is a long-term approach. Um, I wouldn't be able to be drilled down to one. It could be energy. It could be because there's a lot of political pressure and private pressure on that sector, how to materialize that. Yeah. And I think it's always very much driven by public opinion, Absolutely. where to put the push on. Mm -hmm. So if I would make my bet on that one, that might be the direction. Highways is a longer perspective. When you ask about two to three years, I would say 10, 15 years. I have clear vision that we have pay as you drive at a certain stage, for sure. And, and, and your vision for a, a smart highway infrastructure will be that when I get in the car to drive anywhere, yeah. I will be paying to use that highway. Yeah, but in reward, you get and advise which way to drive, which one is the most efficient way, where are the traffic jams, how to avoid them. So the, the trade-off is going to be I will pay, but my reward will be I will never sit in a traffic jam again. And you want to get that <laughs> guaranteed, let me guess. Us. Did you, uh, 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 let me guess, uh, you, you should have a second <laughs> degree as a lawyer? Uh, no, <laughs> no, but I know how to spot future politicians right here. <laughs> yeah. No, I think no. quite clearly you have to give a benefit to the consumer. Yeah, you just obviously. can't sit there and say, pay, and that's it. Yeah. You have to give him something in return. I, th I think all <laughs> voters and consumers would agree with you on that, Mr. Kirschman. Mr. Holtz. I think it we, what we will see is more a kind of interoperability and integration of the different networks. I think it's not a question of an energy network or a question of telecommunication. It's a question of smart mobility, for example, mm -hmm. using car sharing, we have seen it yesterday, getting the energy, um, uh, having the communication clear, the infrastructure, uh, when to use, and managing the traffic jam uh, in this way. I think this will be the next wave of uh, innovation and, and progress, so that we really bring this together. Okay. I think we are on a good way here. Okay, very good. Mr. Archer. 
Look, I think um, mobility is the word that was coming to my mind when you asked the question. I think we've just barely scratched the surface in, term, the surface in terms of uh, mobility as a technology. Uh, you know, we've been using these things for a couple of years now, uh, but they've, and they've profoundly changed the way most uh, business people work on, or, or, and, or, and politicians. You know, we see them, we see them being used everywhere. Um, but there are still in, um, enormous opportunities to, to further embed uh, mobile solutions, you know, in, in watches or whatever, um, and, and, in, and in cars. And, and I think there are still a lot of problems in the mobile space. You know, co coming to Germany, my, my phone works perfectly fine, you know, but right. I don't have a data service. Right. Um, so there are, there are... Well, you could, the, but you have to change your I'd SIM card. Have to change SIM cards or to pay, pay, pay an enormous amount of money. Right. Um, so I think, you know, that's, that's probably a, a bit of an infrastructure issue mm -hmm. uh, in, terms of, in terms of how the planet is currently served. Um, but I do think that mobility is going to be... Uh, is going to change radically the way in which we work and the way in which... Um, agencies, commercial and government, provide services to, to citizens and, yeah, and, and businesses. I, I think you've all implied too that this increased mobility and the smartness of mobile technology means that national borders mean mm. less and less. All right, Mr. Buff, you get the final word. I would clearly vote for uh, the big change happening in the energy network. Probably not so much visible for every consumer yet because the, the smart meter rollout will take time, but the push or wishing to have better services in its private environment is one thing, and the sheer need of having a much smarter network there to control the volatility and flow of energy is, is simply needs that. So it's, it's going to happen for sure. Okay, good. Gentlemen, thank you very much for giving us your grades on the smartness of our networks and infrastructures. Thank you very much. Thanks. All right. Good. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for driving so far. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, that is going to take us to our next keynote address.